Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us today. Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. It's not something that just scientists do, it's something that matters to us all, and what scientists do really impacts our lives. And today I have coming uh, from San Francisco, joining us remotely, is Dr. Kevin Keyes. Welcome, Kevin. Um, Kevin is a uh, postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, San Francisco, Department of Medicine. Uh, and we are going to be talking about some of his work uh, on, on asthma, uh, genomics, and ancestry. Uh, as our show subtitle is a breathtaking combination. Um, so Kevin, perhaps you can talk a little bit though, we're, we're, this is actually the first of a series of shows that we're going to be doing over the next few months uh, involving a, a group called SACNAS, which is Society for the Advancement of Chicano, Hispanics, and Native Americans in Science. And it's a, it's a, a large uh, support organization that uh, helps get various minority group uh, representatives more involved in science, provides uh, mentors, role models, all kinds of support. And uh, Kevin, maybe you could start and tell us a little bit about sort of you, how SACNAS played a role in getting you involved in science. Sure. So I have been a member of SACNAS since attending my first conference in 2007. SACNAS is a group that, that provides mentorship and, and support for people that are traditionally underrepresented in the sciences. Um, originally, it was founded by a group of, of Chicanos, Native Americans, but it's actually grown in the intervening 45 years to become the largest multicultural and multidisciplinary science uh, outreach organization in the United States. That's very cool. Um, so this, it's, it's, uh, it's been an integral part of, of my development because uh, when I first went there, I, I was able to see scientists like me. And it's been now, let's see, now about 12, 13 years later, um, I've stayed very close to the organization. I like what they do. I like the, the people I meet there. And now that, of course, being now that I started an undergrad, I'm, I'm a postdoc, and I can also give back to the undergrads. So I, I can see myself and the students at these national conferences that they host. Excellent, excellent. And people may not know this, but as our upcoming graphic here will show, the SACNAS is having their annual conference here in Hawaii this year, uh, coming up in the fall, uh, the end of October, uh, I think the 31st, right, 31st through November mm -hmm. 2nd. Uh, it'll be mm -hmm. here at the convention center, so, and it's, it's gonna be a great uh, gathering. They're gonna, I guess, uh, in part reaching out to, to sort of a new audience for them, the, the, the audience of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders who have not traditionally, again, they've, they've been very underrepresented in science. And um, this, I think the hope is by bringing the conference here, they'll uh, raise the awareness. And so that's part of what I want to do is, is help raise the awareness of, of this group and all. And uh, since you got, uh, were involved and your name was given to me uh, as, as sort of a, a, a good member to talk to, well, we got you on here. So let's let's move on then a little bit and and tell me uh, tell us about your uh, your research. So you, you study pediatric asthma, that is asthma in kids. Um, mm -hmm. So sort of one sort of what is this and why why is it important? The start from the basics, I guess. Asthma is a it's a condition uh, of the lungs, as most people know. It it involves um, the narrowing of the bronchial airways, and it. It affects a, a tremendous amount of people, actually. It um, has a very high incidence in, in the United States. The, I happen to be one of these people. Of course, I, I had asthma as a child. We traditionally focus on, on a certain kind of asthma, right? So asthma can present itself in many forms, but the one that we care about is the, the allergic type of asthma. And, and here at UCSF, we study the, the genomic basis of asthma. We understand, we want to understand what component of, of our genetics explains asthma incidence. Right, because different, different groups sort of show uh, asthma at sort of different differing rates of the population. And this is sort of an intriguing uh, phenomenon, right? It's not seen in all diseases. Some diseases are pretty much uh, what, you, what you might call even-handed. They affect everyone, everyone around the world pretty equally. But asthma right. is not. Asthma apparently has uh, your genes give you some predisposition for it or some protection against it, one way or the other, right? 
Yeah, that's right. So it's asthma is is unusual in that it, it presents this ethnic disparity in, in incidence and mortality. So in, in the United States, the the groups that well, so here in the lab, I should clarify that we focus on on four ethnic groups. We still focus on uh, Puerto Ricans, African Americans, Caucasians, and Mexicans. Of course, these there are other ethnic groups in, in the United States, but these happen to be the ones in, in our study cohorts. And the, the breakdown of who suffers from asthma is, is a bit strange because it seems like um, the, the Puerto Ricans, for example, suffer much higher than, uh, than the Mexican Americans. Now in the United States, they're both considered Hispanics. This is long known as the Hispanic paradox in asthma. But, but here in the lab, we understand that, that genetically these two groups are, are actually distinct. Um, also, there's the African Americans seem to suffer it very have a very high incidence as well, and so we we want to understand to which degree this the separation is genetic. Right. So, and we've got, we've got a, a graph I think that shows uh, that that basic incidence difference, right? That's right. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can see, see. You go you ahead see and explain it. Splits it. out by. Yeah. So I was going to say that you can see that you know very clearly splits out by the the four groups that I've mentioned, the four populations in the United States, and this is asthma prevalence in the United States. So. We're saying that amongst Puerto Rican children, um, at around 26% of them will suffer from asthma. It's a pretty dramatic. Yeah, it's almost it's two and a half percent. times as high as. Yes, yeah, it's about a quarter actually. Um, two and a half times higher than than Mexican American children. Um, but so prevalence is, of course, how many people have it. But uh, there's there's also a similar situation with mortality. So uh, for reasons that we don't fully understand, Puerto Rican children and African American children also die from asthma more often, right? This is taken in, uh, I think it's per 100,000 um, patients. Oh. You'll see that African-Americans and Puerto Ricans die much more often than the other two groups. Yeah, even even in greater proportions than, there, than the, that first uh, figure would have, re would have reflected, right? I mean, more, yeah, that's higher, right. That's right. Yeah. wow. That's right. Huh. So this, this is a very, sort of in a sense, a very selective disease, and yeah. And you could think about it as one way, because um, so there's, if you look at, uh, for example, the, the, the drug response, right? So you, one of the characteristics of having asthma or controlling asthma, um, especially with children, is that they, they have inhalers. So I, having had asthma as a child, I had these inhalers, right? Right. And it turns out that the inhalers don't seem to work as well in, in all populations, right? So... Um, this, this is a, the third component of this, is that the, the Puerto Rican and African American children show a, a different drug response to the corticosteroids that they inhale to control their asthma. Oh, huh. uh, and they're not getting as much benefit out of the drug, you're saying? That's correct. So uh, the corticosteroid is supposed to reverse the constriction of the airways. And imagine it's opening up the, the airways in your lungs, right? It's, exactly. And so, um, it seems like the the drugs, the standard drugs that are used to do this, don't seem to work quite as well in these populations. You have you have a higher incidence, a higher mortality, and, and a worse drug response, right? Right. Um, so the one thing to keep in mind, though, is that asthma actually afflicts everyone. It can afflict everyone, but for some reason, right? It's there's this ethnic breakdown that we think is is explained by by very small genetic dis uh, genetic differences, right? Right. We human beings are mostly alike. We're over 99.99% .99 alike at the genetic level, right? right? But maybe maybe that tiny, tiny portion of our genomes that, are, that vary, right, that might explain why these drugs aren't working. Right. That's quite intriguing that we see this, this kind of, of uh, differences in, as you say, in the frequency, in the mortality, and in the, the mm -hmm. uh, response to treatments. Uh, mm -hmm. And given, yeah, given the, 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 as you point out, the overwhelming similarity uh, of people to one another, that, that's, that's interesting to see. So in some sense, yes. I, yeah. I, I don't want to make too much too light of it, but, but your, your task should be simple because there's very little of the genome left. It's different, right? Right. It always <laughs> seems like that. But remember, the genome is, is 3 billion bases long. So if we are even a 99.9999% alike, <laughs> There right. are going to be several thousands of bases that are different, right? And and then you've got to yeah you've got to find that you've got to look mm -hmm. at large population samples 
And, right, and exactly. Try to see what, uh, where those differences pop up, where consistently you're seeing that. Mm -hmm. Ideally, yes, you'd want yes. to do that in the people who are actually suffering from asthma versus those who aren't in their same ethnic group, right? And, right, and, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so that, that's got to be quite, a, uh, quite an undertaking. Um, but, but asthma is, you've talked about several types of it, the, and the, the allergic type you refer to. So it, it, people get something triggers an asthma attack, right? In them. Mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. tip, typically something they've inhaled or some environmental factor. Yeah, so you can, you can induce asthma from an allergen, obviously, but also from pollution. Um, there is, there, people hypothesize that there is actually an exercise-induced asthma uh, for people who do really strenuous amounts of exercise. There is another hypothesis that there might be an asthma subtype related to obesity, that for some reason um, people who, are, who uh, have very high BMIs suffer a very different kind of bronchial constriction that's not the same as the allergic form of asthma. Wow. Interesting, interesting. Uh, so there are there are a lot of subtleties to this then. So that's uh, mm -hmm. that's pretty 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 amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. So so how do you how do you go out doing your what what sort of what do you what do you do to look at this stuff in, in so sort of simple non technical terms? Sure. So we here in the lab do what are called genetic association tests, and in simple terms, what we want to do is compare the the differences the genetic differences between two groups. You grab your children who have asthma and your children who do not have asthma, we call this left group the control group that doesn't have asthma. And then we, we gather the, their genotypes, right? We sequence the genomes of each of these subjects. And then we simply compare the, the genotypes, right? We have to align these genomes and we compare down the line, say, you know, this group has asthma and this does not. Do any of the genotypes differ? Does the variance between the genotypes differ? And uh, we can statistically determine to which extent the, the differences in these genotypes actually affect the, the outcome, which would be disease status of asthma. Okay, okay. So it's a, it's a fairly uh, sophisticated process involving uh, a lot of sort of bioengineering, but also very, very uh, high-level uh, mathematical algorithms. So some, some people do it that way, but um, actually, this is, this is a beautiful part about this particular field that um, these particular analyses are fundamentally very simple, right? So the, the statistical mechanics of them are, are quite simple. The complications come from the data itself, right? You have to have an understanding of genetic inheritance, the population genetics behind how humans arose. And those, those details actually matter a lot. They can dramatically change the outcome of the association test. So it is, it's beautiful in that um, some of your statistics 101 if you, if you take that statistics 101, you can actually understand the statistical process of how we get here, right? Um, but then you have to re remember that uh, the reason that we, you know, have scientists still doing this is that the data, the nuances of the data end up being very, very important in this field. Yeah, da data often are messy when they're real world data. And we're going to look mm -hmm. into a bit more of that aspect when we come back. Right now, I'm told we need to go off to a brief break. Uh, Kevin Keyes mm -hmm. from the University of California, San Francisco Department of Medicine is with me today, uh, virtually here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we'll be back in one minute. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha.
And welcome back to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. You've joined us for a, a show on asthma, uh, genomics, and uh, ancestry. Uh, and uh, Kevin, Dr. Kevin Keyes is uh, joining us here remotely from the University of California, San Francisco, in the Department of Medicine. Well, welcome back, Kevin. Hi there. Good to see you again. And in the first part of the show, we were, we were talking a little bit about, about the, the sort of the different groups, different ethnic groups, and their different uh, proclivities for getting asthma, the different sort of mortality rates they suffer from asthma, and the different responses uh, they have to asthma drugs. And I, I want to maybe take a look at, at our next, next image, because I, I think that might help people understand a, a little bit. It's not quite as cut and dried as we were talking about, right? That is, mm -hmm. we talk about those groups as if they're sort of uniform groups, but they really aren't. Every, all of us basically have genes from a bunch of different people and, and mm -hmm. ancestors. Yeah. But certain groups tend, right. tend prevalently to have more ancestry from certain other from certain ancestral groups, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So, um, and that, that in, in, in that image, I showed you the, the four populations that, that we study here in the lab at UCSF. Right. I made a side note, by the way, because uh, to, for your Pacific Islander viewers, that um, we don't happen to study Pacific Islanders, but the, the story behind Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States, they, it's a very large, diverse group. Right. So um, there's a lot of the princi same principles will apply, but you know the story, the details are different. In that image, though, um, you can see that we model these particular four ethnic groups as having come from three ancestral populations, right? And if you think about your world history and American history, it sort of makes sense how this, this pans out. We have some European ancestors, some African ancestors, and some Native American ancestors. Right. And depending on, on you know, how many ancestors you have in your lineage, it'll determine roughly what kind of global genetic ancestry you have in your genome. So on the left over here, we'll have the Caucasians that are mostly European. Mexican-Americans are, are strongly mixed between European and Native American with a tiny bit of African. There actually are some Afro-Mexicans. Uh, I don't know if it's not a very large population, but they exist. There are African-Americans that are mostly European and African with some uh, Native American ancestry. And then there are the, the Puerto Ricans who actually have a substantial mixture of all three ancestries. Right, and even within, as that chart showed, within the, those groups, people can vary tremendously in terms of their mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. percentages and, and uh, sort of That's right. who, who, their, who their ancestors were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and one of the things that you were talking about uh, in some of our earlier conversations is that, of course, this, uh, I, I guess it shouldn't surprise us, but, but this propensity to get uh, asthma more frequently in some of these groups, to get asthma apparently worse, and to be less uh, responsive to good asthma drugs means that the, certain of these groups, like, uh, like African Americans, typically suffer more from impaired lung function, basically, or impaired mm -hmm. I guess, bronchial mm -hmm. function. And, mm -hmm. and, yet, and yet we see lots and lots of, of examples of, of great athletes uh, among, among these mm -hmm. populations. Is there mm -hmm. anything sort of discordant about that, or, or is, this, is this understandable? Uh, so there, there actually isn't anything discordant about it. It, it depends on, on a couple of things, actually. So one thing to remember is that asthma is actually very common amongst all these ethnic groups, right? So I've shown the prevalences are a little different, but asthma is, is a very widely uh, common disease in the United States. It's actually, um, I think there's, I provided another figure for you, that it afflicts, I think, well over 20 million people in the United States. Now, um, to give you an idea, one of the more prevalent diseases might be, for example, uh, obesity, right? Um, but asthma is on par with things like cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes, right? In, in terms of actual, the number of people that suffer in the United States. So within such a large group, you're actually likely to get a lot of variation. So asthma is not, I guess I would call it an obstacle, but it's not an insurmountable barrier to becoming um, an athlete. The other thing to remember is that, uh, you know, it's not just for African-American athletes. There actually are many non-African-American athletes that also suffer from asthma. Right. right. Yeah. Indeed. And, and that figure you were referring to, I think that's, I think that's the next figure in, our, in that series, right? Mm -hmm. so, that's right. Uh, yeah. Can, can you just explain this to, to the audience a little bit, particularly what that, what that uh, vertical axis represents? Yeah, so we, we actually compiled this in our lab. This is something that our lab has produced. Um, on, on the X, you have the number of affected people in, in millions, right? Now, you can see, for example, that there are 
type adult obesity is, is very prevalent. Things like asthma, coronary heart disease, and type 2 diabetes run around maybe 25 to 28 million people. And a little less lower are things like childhood obesity and COPD. Right. But the y-axis is actually very interesting, right? Because we wanted to measure the what we call the disparity ratio. If you take the ratio of the largest incidence of the disease versus the smallest uh, incidence of the disease, right? And you've done this, split these incidences by ethnicity, then asthma seems unusually high, right? At the, the disparity between those who suffer the most, in this case, the Puerto Ricans, and those who suffer the least, in this case, the Mexican Americans, is remarkably high compared to other diseases. So asthma is, it affects all people, right? But it does not affect all people equally. Right, whereas uh, your chronic pulmonary obstructive disease there and adult obesity on that, on that chart are sort of equal opportunity mm -hmm. diseases and affect all groups yes. pretty much equally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that, that's, that's an intriguing finding. And uh, it's, 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 it speaks well to, to the kind of science that we're able to do now that we're able to tease apart those sorts of relationships, right? And, and able mm -hmm. to understand that it's, uh, there, are, there are subtle genomic factors that, that are, are playing, playing on in. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you take this in a, in a more practical direction. What, what, uh, you know, what impact does this have then on, on people in terms of sort of the, their lives? Well, so it's, it's not unique to asthma, but let's say, for example, that we think about the, the term of, you know, genomic precision medicine. Precision medicine is, is a growing field. There's a lot of interest in making me medicine very personalized to right. each individual subject. And so and asthma happens to be one case where this might be a very important thing to think about. Um, but, but of course, it's still a developing field. So we can see, those of us here who work at UCSF, we foresee in the future, maybe not necessarily tomorrow, but sometime in the near future, in which the, the ability to understand your genetic ancestry and, and your genetic information might end up being very useful in the clinic. So if you, if you went to 23andMe or something and, and got a, a breakdown of your ancestry, this, this might be mm -hmm. a useful thing to take in and show to your doctor and say, hey, you know, here's who I am. And then they could That's say, right. well, so 20 you, you, can, you should take drug X instead of drug Y then, right? Yeah, so 23andMe happens to be one very large player in this field. There are other companies, uh, Ancestry comes to mind. I think there are groups like Helix, many of these companies that um, are trying to figure out if they can use your ancestry profile to better inform how you'll respond to your disease risk and how you'll respond to drugs, right? So this, this is a very plausible thing to happen in the future. Right, and, and we've seen some examples. You, you were quoting me uh, the, the story of Plavix as, a, as a sort of a, 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 almost a cautionary tale in this, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, I right. suspect our audience probably doesn't know it. Can you brief, give us a, a, a brief version of that? Mm -hmm. Yes, Plavix is a, is a blood thinner. It was produced by, um, I guess it was originally produced by Sanofi, but um, the, the producer in the United States was Bristol Myers Squibb. Now, uh, Plavix was a very profitable drug for them, uh, used a lot in, in the clinic, and potentially you know, to relieve an emergency blood clot. However, over time, people started to notice that Plavix wasn't working the same in all groups. And in fact, uh, in this case for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, for I think it's about 30% or 40%, right, between in that range, Plavix in that group worked like a placebo. So you can imagine that if you're in an emergency situation where you need to unclog a, a critical blood vessel and this patient, an Asian American patient, is administered Plavix, there's a very high chance that the drug will not work. Now, this ended up becoming such a scandal that the state of California, and I believe the state of Hawaii, um, actually sued the, the drug manufacturers, right? Because they, they uh, contested that the drug manufacturers had distributed and marketed this drug without fully understanding how it would impact the people of their state. Interesting, interesting. Uh, and, uh, but I don't think from what I heard, if I understood you correctly, these lawsuits are still pending or in process. Nothing has been resolved, yeah. right? They, they aren't fully resolved right. yet. I think that these lawsuits uh, started, well, many years ago, actually, at least 2014, <laughs> if not earlier. Right. But, but you can see this, this brings up all kinds of interesting issues, right? Here is a drug that may work perfectly well for some people. Some percentage of patients mm -hmm. respond quite well to it. it. It's a valuable product for them. It certainly shouldn't be, they mm -hmm. should not be denied that. But as, a, right. as yeah. a physician, you certainly don't want to be giving that drug to somebody who's in a group 
where they have good odds that they won't respond well to it. They'll, they'll respond badly or not at all, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, right. especially in an emergency situation, right. right? These physicians, they want to know that the drugs that they rely on will actually work for all the patients that come through their hospitals. Right. Now, yeah. no, it's a, it's a great example. There, there are no guarantees, and and we're finding now, uh, as you as you so so nicely point out, these these subtle differences that are turning out to be very important, of course, for some people, life and death, literally, uh, matters. Mm -hmm. But only now we're com coming to light about, about this and, and how, mm -hmm. you know, how the drug companies are going to deal with this in the future going forward is, is, a, is an intriguing uh, question, right? They just need to make sure that they study their drugs on everyone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they'll have to presumably start attaching warnings to these and, and making it better known that these drugs are only work better for certain groups and are you know, le less of a good bet for other groups, right? That's actually, I think that some of the drugs already do this. Um, there might be in the near future uh, some push to actually have these drugs tested in clinical trials on, on more than just one population. Typically, for many reasons, uh, these drugs are only tested on, on one population group, right? They want to control the, the genetic uh. variation in some sense. Right, so there might be it's entirely plausible in the future after the the field really realizes that in the drug companies too they realize that oh, this is a thing we must care about genetic ancestry when we develop our drugs, that the clinical trials themselves will become much more diverse. Interesting, interesting. It, it, that sort of reflects this issue you know, that I run into as an educator of, of people talk about equity now, and, and we're, this is sort of equity in yes. medicine. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. Yes. Hey, well, this, this is exciting stuff. It's great to, to learn about, about this. Um, wonderful to, that you take your time here to come and talk with us. I appreciate it. And uh, let me just uh, remind the, our audience again, the SACNAS International Conference is going to be here in Honolulu on uh, October 31st through November 2nd this, uh, this coming fall. Uh, a wonderful event it's sure to be. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin. I appreciate your being here. And uh, good luck to you in your, in your future endeavors. And uh, to those of, us, those of you watching us here, I hope you'll come back next week and see us again on the next episode of Likeable Science.